have living for God's G, glory. You have the great commandment, right? The great G commandment to love the Lord and love one another, fulfillment of the law. You can't do it in your own strength kind of thing. You have the gospel, you know, that Paul said, I would know nothing among you except the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have one final G, one that we often ignore or misunderstand. It's called the Great Commission, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's what brings into focus this priority of people, is making disciples. That alone should be something that causes us to want to get it right. Most Christians, when I mention that word discipleship, you only see it one way. Or you have a distorted view, and therefore it's kept you from actually being in the process of making disciples. I want to clarify that. I think if I were to ask almost every single one of you in this room, and I almost made you do it towards one another before you sat down, give me a definition of discipleship, you either couldn't do it or it would be the wrong one. Because we have warped ideas. We've heard the wrong kind of teaching. So I want to give you uh, what I spent three years working on, is basically trying to clarify what is this process, Old Testament, New Testament, etc., and focus on the key passage, the clearest passage, probably the most familiar passage, but I'm not going to do it in order. I'm going to teach this passage, but I'm going to show you what discipleship is in a way that would help you to understand this passage, maybe in a new way, and understand your involvement in this process. Listen, how many of you are parents in this room? Can I see your hands? Okay, how many of you are grandparents in this room? Listen, you're in the process of discipleship. You are discipling. You're not parenting. There is no verb in the New Testament, in the Old Testament for parenting. That's a word that we've made up. You are discipling your children. You are discipling your grandchildren. And it's not just you. Hopefully there are others involved in their lives who are also discipling them. And we need to understand it in terms of the way the New Testament describes it and not the way that certain parachurch organizations have defined it and practiced it, etc. We've been warped in our understanding. So I want to bring clarity to that if I can, because you and I are commanded by Christ. Are you ready? You want to write it down? Here it comes, your definition that I want you to keep, that I want you to store away, that I want you to pop off the next time you think about this issue of discipleship, and that is to pursue intentional relationships for the purpose of the gospel and growth in Christ. I'm going to read it twice or three times or four times. Don't worry. In the context of the local church, one more time, it is to pursue intentional relationships for the purpose of the gospel and growth in Christ, the gospel and growth in Christ in the context of the local church. That's how God defines discipleship. You're using the process of relationship to invest into somebody so they either, are you ready, come to Christ or they become like Christ. Every sermon that campus preaches is from this location is trying to accomplish one of two purposes. Every time I preach any sermon at Faith Bible Church, there are only two purposes. In order to bring glory to God, we want people, are you ready, to come to Jesus Christ in saving faith or to become like Jesus Christ. That's how we bring him glory. Are you with me on this? You come to Christ, or you become like Christ. That's why we're here. Discipleship is using the relationship that you have with someone, a friendship with someone, not necessarily one-on-one, but intentionally, even a group of men together, so that every single man in that group or one-on-one becomes like Jesus Christ. Or it might be that it's a raw group of guys, and you're just hoping that some of these guys would come to Christ, and then they would become like Christ, if you follow what I'm saying. We want them to repent and come to faith in Christ. And so that's the, the passion. It's all throughout the New Testament. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, younger men are submitting themselves to the older men. They're following the older men. Hebrews 13.7 and 17, church members are imitating their elders and following them. Colossians 3.20, children are following and obeying their parents. This is not option. This is not to be ignored. And we have dismissed it. I'm just telling you, it is a chaos in the... the the church in the U.S. and the church internationally over this issue. They are not getting it. The enemy has successfully distorted the Great Commission so now that it is ineffective, and we're blowing it. A lot of it happens just by natural relationship, but it's not intentional. People aren't going after it, 
and you as a parent, you as a grandparent, and you as a member of this church are to be intentionally investing into other people so that they would either come to Christ or become like Christ. That's what God has called us to. Some of you won't pursue discipleship because you've got these weird views. You think that it's, man, I've got to meet one-on-one with a guy over a book at Denny's. Right? And it's got to be Denny's because everything ta- tastes like scrambled eggs. Everything. Steak tastes like scrambled eggs. Everything. So you've got to get there because somehow that's more spiritual when you eat lousy food and you invest in each other over a book. You know? Or you think, oh, once a week meeting, comparing your life against a, gr- a good Christian book. Or you're thinking it's only done with one older mentor and, and you can't find that perfect person who's going to solve all your idiosyncrasies and imperfections. Or discipleship only counts when you're listening to some sort of seminary guru who's bringing you all these pearls of wisdom. And, and really that's not a part of what the New Testament describes discipleship. It's not a lecture environment. It's a relationship that you're investing into other people. That's what it's called. So understand, get a clear picture. The clear picture, if you can, is by turning to this command in Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, the last two verses of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Actually, it's 16 through 20. So we're going to look at that. This is the Gospel of the Jews, obviously. Uh, uh, They are very myopic. They thought the message was intended just for them, and God says, no, it's to the nations. And he basically reminds them that they are to go and make disciples of all the nations, of all people, not just Israel. It'll be a corporate mission of a local church body, and it's the individual mission of every single Christian in this room. This is your mission. This is your command, and it must not be ignored. You need to capture it back. You need to fight for it. If you're going to be a man, you're going to fight for those things that are true. This is true. you got to go after it. And before you read it out loud, let me catch some things that are obvious and maybe not so obvious in this passage. Now, some of you, again, need to, again, interact with discipleship. Some of you have never been disciples. Some of you have never made. Some of you are crazy. You're thinking that there's no way I can do this. Yes, you can. This is not based on how well you have your Christian act together. This is not that you've now reached some sort of level that you can invest. We are to invest into each other, learn from one another, even from each other's mistakes, right? Don't you learn well when you make mistakes? Can I hear an amen to that? You go, yeah, I get it. That's what we do relationally. We're not beating each other up and evaluating each other. We're growing with one another, helping each other to become like Christ. Look at verse 18. This command comes from Christ, who is the all-powerful, sovereign God who's in charge. He has all authority, right? He says, I have all authority. Look at verse 19. The command, the main command is what? It's make disciples. It's not go. The main verb here is make disciples. The command, the imperative is make disciples. It is defined by three participles, going, baptizing, and teaching. Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. So it starts with the main command, but it's defined by going, baptizing, and and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And then verse 20, take a look. This command comes from with God's special promise of his presence. He says, I am with you always. And it's as you're going about this process of discipleship, he is with you in this process. Verse 20, this command is still active today. It is still intentional today. Jesus made that really clear because when he said at the very end of this command, even to the end of the what? Age. Are we there yet? then therefore discipleship and making disciples in this great commission is still intact. It's still for us today until he is at the end of the age. We're to be about this process. So let me read it out loud. You look at it, and then we're going to pick it apart and show you actually how practical it is and how much you need to be involved in this process. Are you ready? Matthew 28, 16. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain, which we don't know exactly where this was, which Jesus had designated... When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. They're thinking, wow, is, is this really him? You know, and and, and uh, they're, they're doubting, in a sense, what their purpose and what, what they're going to be doing here. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority had been given unto me into heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and, main verb, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, allow God's word to give you an eye exam and to see whether discipleship is really what this passage is saying and not what you thought. 
and clarify your thinking. You know, when you go, you go to the eye exam, it's like, this is fuzzy, this is good, this is better, right? So let's move our, our understanding from fuzzy to clear, can we? And so what's clarity here? Well, many of you need to fix your distorted view because some of you don't understand Christ's passion about this. This command, though it's listed in Matthew, is actually in fum, some form in every gospel and acts. That's why it's the Great Commission. It's something that's repeated. It's something the church shouldn't lose sight of, but we have. Let me announce to you, we have. We talk about it. We have little discipleship programs, but we've lost exactly what God had in mind. So let's recapture that if we can. And each of you need to embrace, in a sense, the process of discipleship, no matter where you're at spiritually. And the Spirit of God, I think, wants you to make you more like Jesus. And he uses the entire process of discipleship to basically help fellow Christians in relationship with one another to make that happen. So this is the big G here, number one in your outline. Making disciples is not an option. It's not an option. It is the Great Commission. You see from verses 16 through 18 that this is really important. He is resurrected from the dead. He has proven everything he said and everything he did was true. This is one of the things that we've lost in our understanding. Do you believe that everything that Jesus said was true, yes or no? Do you think that everything that Jesus did was best? Well, he made disciples. He made disciples. And the process in which he made disciples is somewhat shocking. It's somewhat overwhelming. But we need to understand what that means. And this is most likely the event where there's 500 people. So this isn't just for pastors or missionaries or spiritual leaders. This is for everybody. There's 500 people here. And God in the flesh, Christ, gives this command. It's his will. It's his final earthly order. It's the final command from the commander. His commission comes from God, who is the sovereign over this world, okay, with all authority. And this command comes with not only all authority, but you can do nothing without Christ. So this command comes with all authority and power. He's going to empower you to do this. And so he tells you that. He affirms that. But the church, again, is missing it. We're ignoring this command. And the church elevates other priorities over this. I meet church after church after church. I don't know what your program is. I don't know what your focus is here. This is not a slam against you. But mo most churches are going, you know what? We've got this Bible study. We've got this going on. We've got this going on. We don't have time for discipleship. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. How did that happen? How did it somehow we miss the priority of the Great Commission that that should be elevated above other things that we're doing? This cannot be skipped over. This is not extra. This is not for the mature. This is for everyone. There's 500 people present. We've got to own this. And this is tough. This is not to beat you up. This is to actually to free you up and to help you to go, look, I can be influential for Christ if I understand what I'm supposed to be doing here. So this is what he's calling us for. And some of you think this is beyond you, but it's not. You're a part of this process of spiritual reproduction from the very beginning. This was the plan. This was the heart of God. This is why he created you. This is why he saved you. You're to be a part of the process of discipleship. It's not the only reason, but this is one of the main reasons why you're here on this planet is to be a part of the process of discipleship. Deuteronomy 6, 7, we already looked at it, right? You shall teach them diligently to your sons. Talk to them while you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. He's talking about discipleship here. That's what that is. Every element of life was an opportunity to model and to teach. Parenting is discipleship. Discipleship is parenting. Throw the word parenting away and just start talking about discipling your kids and you'll get it. That's what you're here for. That's what you're to be about. And now Jesus says to you, until he returns, you and I are to pursue the intentional relationships for the purpose of the gospel and their growth in Christ in the context of the church. Now, what I just said to you, what do you want more than anything for your children? What do you want more than anything? You want them to know Christ for the gospel, and you want them to become like Christ that they would walk independent of you, that they would leave your home and serve Christ. Amen to that? That's discipleship. That's what you're trying to do with them. And what you're trying to do with them, you want to help other men and other individuals within the context of the church do the same. It's not tricky. He's not trying to fool you. This is not a surprise or a shocker. This is just plain New Testament instruction. So now he says to you, basically, I want you to commit to this process, like a relay race, right? You're handing the baton, you're passing it on. Listen, 
okay? I'm 63 now, all right? I'm, I'm trying to figure out how did I get old. My wife and I are trying to figure out how do we become the older couple. We haven't figured that out yet. All of a sudden, we're finding ourselves the older couple. People are looking at us. What do you think? And I'm like, why should you look at me? Oh, I guess I'm 63, you know? So I'm supposed to have an answer or something. Understand this. All along, it's this investment. You're supposed to be passing the baton, and now at 63, I'm looking at our church going, we're going to pass the keys on to the next generation. You realize that as a church. They're, they're either going to pry those keys out of our cold, dead hand, or we're going to hand it to them. And we're going to hand it to them by investing into them, by training them, by equipping them, by bringing them along so that they're stronger and better and more competent leaders than we could ever be, and that, that they will continue on with the leadership of the church. Are you tracking with me? You want that for your kids, don't you? You don't want your kids, I want you to be lesser than me, son. <laughs> I, I want you to be a lesser version of me. You know, you know, never say, you want them to excel in the way that God made them. Amen. Well, that's what we want to do with the church. We want the next generation to be better at what we're doing, stronger, greater witnesses of Christ, more manifesting of his character, and that's discipleship. That's what you're doing. You're investing into them through relationship, through God's word, through the spirit of God, that they would become more like Christ. So when you catch a cold, you avoid. You know, you cover up. You kind of, you know, kind of keep yourself from spreading your germs. Listen, when it comes to discipleship, you want to spread the germs, okay? You want them to understand this process is something that they're to be a part of. And again, there's 500 people present in this situation. And so therefore, we know that it's not just for the leadership. It's not just for the 12. You know what 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, right? The things which you've heard from me and the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Titus chapter 2, verse 3, you know this. Older women are to encourage or train the younger women to what? Love their husbands, love their children, be pure, be sensible. Are you getting this? They were to pass it on. A baby, you know, needs to learn to feed itself and walk. Well, how does it do that? And parents are constantly encouraging. You know, come on, you can do it. You can take that first step. They're constantly around that, encouraging that. Listen, think about that spiritually. That's what you're doing with others around you. You say, come on, make that first step. Oh, that's great. That's great. First step of obedience. Okay, you're developing that character. That's great. You're growing in this way. That's great. You're just constantly encouraging others to be like Christ, to be all that God intended them to be. So that's what you're doing. This is the great commission, and today it's the great omission, and it shouldn't be that way. This is the briefing before the battle. There's no other option, no other directive, no other process that God has put into place. Through his church, we're to make disciples. And God doesn't need you to make disciples, all right, for him, as if he were unable to do it or Christ were unable. Discipleship is mandatory because you need to make disciples. God created you and redeemed you to spiritually reproduce. Dogs bark, ducks swim, Christians make disciples. That's what we're supposed to be about. And it's not to pursue discipleship. If you don't do that, to not pursue discipleship is basically denying why you were saved. That's one of the reasons why you were saved. Making disciples is a command of our general to his army, and disobedience is AWOL. And man, the church today is AWOL. This is Christ's most important assignment for you, not merely to invest in your children, but to mentor the lost world and the saved in the church, to be alongside of them, to encourage them, to be in a group of men that causes one another to seek to grow to be more like Christ. You're to be about that process. You know that there's a Gallup survey of religious America that occurred several years back now. He made this shocking statement. Are you ready? This is what he said. Never before in the history of of the church has the gospel of Jesus Christ made such inroads while at the same time making so little difference in how people live. Why is that? There's two reasons. Number one, bad gospel, bad teaching. Number one, that's the first reason. Bad gospel, bad, bad teaching. Number two, no discipleship. No discipleship, which is a part of the process of what the church is to be about. Discipleship. This weakness is the result of a fascination of making decisions without making disciples. Don't treat discipleship as optional. It's not. Number two in your outline, making disciples is a relational process. A relational process. You say, I can't model. I can't influence. I can't disciple. I can't even get to church on time. How am I supposed to disciple others? Discipleship is a relational process. 
uh, not perfect people, but people in relationship. Discipleship is a commitment of friends to assist each other, to come to Christ, to become like Christ in the context of the church. Look again, verses 19 and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, the main verb, disciples, again, making disciples, is defined by going, three participles, baptizing, and teaching. And this is not a super Christian. The term disciple was the first name of a Christian. Please understand this. When Christianity was first born, they didn't call them Christians. They called them what? Disciples. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, Luke says, telling you that we were all called disciples. Only later did we adopt this idea of Christian, which meant little Christ. It was an insult. You're a little Christ. Okay, but a disciple was the first term that was ever. It didn't mean you were super spiritual. didn't mean you were cut above. You were just a disciple, a believer, a follower of Christ. And the word disciple means learner, write that down, and follower. It means a learner and a follower. So make disciples is a command to make learners and followers of you, right? No. Learners and followers of who? Christ. Christ. Okay, that's so you get that. It's not about us. It's about Christ. And even an imperfect person can help someone else to be a follower and a learner of Christ. Are you tracking with me? You don't have to have it all together to be in this process. In fact, if you do have it all together, something's wrong with you. All right? You're not in heaven yet. So you don't have it all together, but you're in process, but you're helping others to become like Christ. We're helping one another to become like Christ. So understand, you're a learner and a follower. Uh, Disciples learn, they follow so that they might be like their master. And true disciples pursue imitating the Lord in every way. In every way, in every thought, in every word, in every action. So even though it's a relationship, Luke reminds you again, a disciple, verse, uh, chapter Luke, verse six, <laughs> chapter 6, verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be what? Like his teacher. Come on, say it again. He'll be what? Like his teacher. Now, that's so important that you understand that. All right? You are like him because of a relationship. Discipleship is a relationship in order to help others become like Christ. Like Christ. And that includes the process of going. See that in the text? Going. That's evangelism. It actually literally means the participle as you're going. As you're going through life, you're making disciples. As you're going. Would you agree the most effective way to reach a non-Christian with the gospel is through relationship? Would you agree with that? Anybody want to fight that? Okay, so statistically... I, I mean, all, all I can do is defend it statistically, not biblically. But I can tell you at T4G, 25,000 people are there. And they're asking a survey of everybody. Who got saved by a track? Who got saved by evangelists on the street? Who got saved? Some of you might have even been there. Uh, who got saved through the, you know, a TV program? Who got saved through this? Who got saved? All these different things. Well, people are raising their hand. You know, 25 people here, 25 people there. Then they asked, who got saved through a relationship with a friend or a family member? And 98% of that audience raised their hands. Most people who come to Christ get saved through a friend or a family member. Somebody who loved them, a neighbor, somebody who began to reach out to them and talk to them. I would say that would be probably true is here as well. Your family or friends basically brought you the gospel in some manner, and you responded to that. So what I'm telling you is that's part of the process of discipleship. It includes this relational evangelism. True discipleship is never divorced from evangelism. You're always concerned. Under our formed faith, we understand that sometimes we're uncertain whether somebody who claims Christ is a Christian. Are you with me on this? Not that we run around doubting all the time, but when they begin to live inconsistently, they begin to lose their assurance, even though they might be secure. We don't know, but we're trying to bring them to a point where they would walk and desire you know, obedience to Christ and as a pattern of their life. As soon as they begin to walk away in disobedience, they lose their assurance. When they walk in obedience, they've gained their insurance, correct? And so this process is going on, and you're helping people, but also you're helping people become like Christ. And that's the process of going. As you're going, you're doing this process. Baptizing is the second part. That's the public identification with Christ. That's somebody who is publicly incorporated in the body, the church. And all believers are not only indwelt by Christ, but they're to be immersed in the local church. And that's part of what we do. We identify with Christ and we immerse with his people. 
And then finally, teaching. Teaching others, he says, to obey all that I've commanded you. That's through relationship. You teach others how to bring their lives under the authority of the word of God. Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. How much? All. All. So every command, you're bringing them under the authority. You're living it, they're living it, they're desiring that. So you're showing them what God says in his word and showing them how to obey God's word in every aspect of your life. You're saying, I just can't do it. I have nothing to offer. I'm a great, too great of a sinner. I'm not mature enough. I'm too young. I've never been discipled. I've, I never discipled. Listen, read your Bible and stop embracing the errors about discipleship. You don't do discipleship alone. Making disciples is never about you alone influencing another person. Let me say that again. Discipleship is never about you alone influencing another person. It is not what Jesus is commanding here. Making disciples, the verb, is plural. Going is plural. Baptizing is plural. Teaching them to obey is plural. It's what we do together. We're all to be about this process of making disciples. We're all to be influencing each other. You're never to be the sole influencer in someone's life. You are never intended to be the sole impactor of another believer. One of the sweetest truths about discipleship is that the term disciple actually disappears after Acts 21. Did you know that? This is scary. Some of you are going to freak out, I know. But the word, the term disciple after Acts 21 disappears. It's not in any epistle, not one. And yet the process of discipleship is everywhere in the New Testament, in the epistles. You say, well, why did the term disciple disappear? Well, let me give you what almost everyone says. Basically, the focus as the New Testament moves from Christ to the apostles, to the elders, and to the church, so does the process of discipleship. Now, hear me out. Christ physically made disciples. Amen? Now, the body of Christ, the physical manifestation of Christ, makes disciples. The plurality of people make disciples. It was never intended for you to be the... You know, the last thing I want, I, 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 you're going to be frightened by this. The last thing I personally want is little Chris Mueller's to be walking around. That would scare me to death. I know who I am, and I don't want them to be like me. I want them to be like Jesus. So I'm involved in that process. Other people are involved in that process. And all of us together can do a whole lot better with that individual than I can personally. And the danger of meeting someone one-on-one for three or four or five years is they're going to become more like me and not like Christ. You getting it? We're all involved in this process. So just as Christ physically discipled his men, now the body of Christ disciples Christ's men. And the local church and all of us together make disciples. You and I are involved in this process of making disciples together. Christians in a church body intentionally invest into others so that they would come to Christ or become like Christ. Think corporate. Think church. This is so hard in our culture. Our culture, again, individualistic. We get into our driveway. The garage door dials down. We don't talk to anybody. You know, in other cultures, something goes wrong in your house, and every neighbor in the entire neighborhood is over at your house. You ever been to Russia? I've been to Russia. We had water coming through the ceiling on on a 220-volt light bulb, you know, pouring through, covering over these wires. We're like, what do we do? We don't speak a lick of Russian. We're over there to teach some pastors through a translation. It was crazy. Every single person in that apartment building was in our apartment. They all come over, and they're all, you know, and they're trying to solve this thing, and they're all involved in the process because they think more corporate. They think more community than we do. It's just part of their culture. Our culture is way too individualistic. We're way too private, and we, we, it's stifling some of our involvement and investment in the process of discipleship. We need to recognize that and get over those cultural moorings because you as an individual believer are a part of the process of impacting others to live like Christ. Stop thinking solo. You can meet with someone one-on-one. That's not dangerous. It's actually quite good. There's great accountability. It's wonderful. Just don't make that the sole process, correct? Just don't make it only you forever. Uh, I remember early on as a Christian, there was a guy at a Christian camp I want to tell you about, and, and all these kids would come up, and they called themselves Brian's kids. You know, they were Brian's kids. And you're like, wait, wait, wait. They're supposed to be Christ's kids, not Brian's kids right? It's not about us. It's not about their attachment to you. Their attachment should be to Christ. 
You, you, you're giving that away, but the goal is we're all doing that. We're all investing in that manner. You need others to make impact those you invest in so they grow to be more like Christ. Parents, you need this for your children. The church needs this for her saints. It's a basic misunderstanding of the church to isolate yourself from the church. It's, we need to be that involvement. So parents don't have all the spiritual gifts, right? Do you parents have all the spiritual gifts, yes or no? Then you need the other gifts to be involved in your life, and you need the other gifts to be involved in your children's lives. For them to be like Christ. You do. You're, you're, they're, they're never your disciples, they're Christ. So understand, even the way that you deal with the way your kids grow should be this way. I mean, the funnest thing, and I, I'm sure some of you are just like us. Our kids, you know, we'd be beating on them on some issue, right? When, especially when they're adolescents. You know, just going after something. Go, see, the, oh, see a weakness. Anybody with me on this? You see a weakness, you go, all the scripture, memorize. You're praying. You're talking to them about it. You're giving them lessons. You're da, da, da. Then they come home, okay? And you've been doing this for like six, seven years. Then they come home from youth ministry one night. You ever had this happen? And they're going, oh, man, Pastor Morgan, he taught on this passage. And, oh, I was so convicted over, over the same issue you've been talking about for seven years. And they're just, wow, I totally get it. This is incredible. This is going to change my entire life. And right then and there, you want to say, I've been telling you this for seven years. But you don't say that. What do you say? Praise God. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy. I'm excited. I don't care who taught them. I just want them to get it that they become like Christ. Then my wife and I would go in our bedroom and say, we've been telling them this for seven years. <laughs> Frustrating, isn't it? Listen, instead of Christ bodily making disciples, Christ now uses his body to make disciples. And it's the body of Christ which disciples, which you're a part of, that relational impact. So again, meeting one-on-one, -on -one, super effective. That's a relational impact. It increases intensity and accountability, but it also increases the possibility later on of them becoming more like you than Christ, so you've got to be careful, but it's good. It's good. It's healthy, but discipleship can be one-on-one, -on -one, or it can be a group together of all, a bunch of guys that are committed saying, we want to grow to be like Christ. We want to see Christ-like character in our lives. We're going to work on these things. We're going to hold each other accountable. We're going to confess when we fail. Maybe you guys are saying, man, I'm, I'm really impatient with my kids. Maybe I, I'm, I'm just so impatient with my wife, or I'm so frustrated over this particular area. Then they start praying for you. And then every week they're asking you about it. You know, eventually they're going to get tired of that and hit you with the two by four of truth in some way, right? And they're going to nail you and keep working on you. And so you begin to develop and grow. That's discipleship. It's okay. It's part of the process of what God has put in place. It's the Great Commission. So if you're meeting one-on-one -on -one or you're in a group of men or a group of women and all of a sudden you're through this loving discussion and you find out that Bill, man, is really blowing it with his finances and he really needs help and none of you guys are, you know, you're all kind of struggling in that same area. I'm just using this as an illustration. Then maybe you'll send Bill to go talk to Fred, who's the super finance guy, who really understands all the scripture on finances. And, you know, he spends a little bit of time with Fred and he gets mentored by Fred, comes back and begins to, you know, show some order in and, and, and his own finances and he begins to influence you guys with fun. That's how it works. Are you tracking with me? It's not about your group. It's not about what you're, it's about becoming like Christ. Bring your life under the authority of the word of God in everywhere, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. Are you, are you getting that now? It's different than what we used to think, but it's biblical. It's a biblical process. And the goal is not to meet as a group. The goal is not to have one-on-one -on -one meeting. The goal is to become like Christ. And the means is anyone and everything in relationship in the body of Christ who can relationally help in that process getting you there. Sometimes you're in a group of guys, you go, I don't know what to do. So you invite somebody in who does know what to do and walks you through the scripture so you can implement those things. You tracking with me? It's the process of relationship. Now think corporate. You're part of the body, which disciples. You contribute sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. You sometimes in a group committed to maturing in Christ, but it's the body of Christ, which disciples. So people come to Christ or become like Christ. So far so good, or have I lost you? Jesus said, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, teaching all of us together to become more like Christ. Discipleship is that relational process of healthy church body. Number three in your outline, making disciples is imitating what Christ did. Now it's going to get really scary. You thought that was bad. This is simply and so very crucial to you and to me. 
Christ made disciples. How did Christ do it? How did he do it? What? Spent time with them. Let me, let me put it more dramatically. He lived with them. He lived with them. Now, that's incredible because you feel the responsibility as a parent. Your kids are living with you. And that's the ultimate discipleship process. And that's why the greatest influence in your kids' lives will be you for better or for, you know, for worse. It will be you. You are discipling them. The question is, is how good of a disciple are you? And is it intentional? Are you intentionally investing into them? Because Christ answered their questions. He ate with them. He taught the multitudes. He modeled for his men, so much so they began to ask him questions. He sent them out two by two to do ministry so they could come and report about it. Discipleship is going. It's baptizing. It's teaching them to obey, evangelizing, immersing in the church, coming under the authority of the Word of God in every aspect of our lives. And the New Testament reinforces this. You've read these passages, 1 Peter 2, 21. Christ also suffered you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our what? Example, Philippians 3.17, brethren, join in following my what? Example, to observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Hebrews 13.7, remember those who led and spoke the word to you. Consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. Christianity is both caught and taught. It's not just a lesson. It's not just a sermon. It's a life. Our faith is better imitated than merely instructed. It's often that you need to see, well, how does this play out? You're talking about these principles. How does this live out? And it's showing them how it's lived out. Discipleship, are you ready, is not preaching the word to someone. It's not teaching someone. It's not modeling the word to someone. Teach, teach. Discipleship is not going through a book with someone. Discipleship is all of that. It's not just one thing. It's all of that and more. Life on life. Every relationship intentionally pursuing becoming like Christ. Keeping that first love right before us. Don't think discipleship is a curriculum. Don't think of it as a book. Don't think of it as a class. Don't think of it as a course. In a classroom, stop that. What, what, what you're doing is this. You're, you're thinking about discipleship in terms of a playbook. Okay, you, you like football. I, I, I know you do. You must love football. It's, it's a man thing, okay? So just, just, just by way of illustration, you want to be a Green Bay Packer, which is a great and noble <laughs> desire. And so I decide I'm going to help you in that process. So I hand you the playbook to the Green Bay Packers for next season. And you memorize it, okay? You, you've got it down. Any moment they can call out a play, you've got, you know exactly what to do, right? You've got the playbook down. Now my question, did that make you a great Green Bay Packer? What's the answer? Nope. You know why? Because you didn't run the plays with the team. You didn't interact with all the other members of the team. You didn't do it a thousand times like they would. You didn't lift weights. You're not of the body weight, okay? <laughs> or maybe you're of the weight, just not the shape. Okay, so <laughs> understand, you got to be a lot more than just know the plays. Are you tracking with me? So we've done this in Christianity. We've said, well, just get them the information just get them the scripture, and they've got it, when often they don't. And that's why discipleship was a part of that process of learning it, watching it, seeing it practice out, applying it together, practicing it together, and going through that process where we're learning from other men how they're implementing the truth that we're learning, how we're applying the truth that we're learning, holding each other accountable to run better and faster and harder within the context of our Christian faith. Are you tracking with me? It's not just the playbook. Now look, you got to have the playbook or you're a disaster. All right? You have to have the playbook. Otherwise, you can't do anything as a Christian. You got to learn this book. You got to. At the same time, we need as Christians the opportunity to help each other to practice this book to invest into each other so we can apply this book, and that's the process of discipleship. That's what he's taught, teaching them to obey, observe, observe, watching all that I've commanded you. How do I live out the truth of the scripture? Are you getting this? How do I do that? Let's share that with each other and hold each other accountable, encourage each other. And when we fail, we call each other and we help one another. Listen, at our church at FBC, it's part of our culture, but it started with men who knew nothing about discipleship. Absolutely nothing. And we said, we're just going to jump in. 
okay? We're not going to teach it for years and then finally jump into the process. We're going to start getting guys to meet together and pray for each other and help each other. And I'm telling you, 80% of the guys that we started with are still with us, and they are growing like crazy. Because they're in this process of just, they don't care. They're, they, they know that they're a sinner, okay? They know the other guys are sinners. They're not looking for their faults, and they're not talking to anybody else about what they're struggling with. They're just going, okay, you got to struggle, let's go after it. You got to deal with pornography, let's go after it. We're going to help you overcome that. You got a problem with anger with your children, we're going to go after it and help you that and pray for you and walk through that process. They don't think they're better than you, they're just going after it. They love holiness just like you two, but they know they're a sinner just like you're a sinner. Can I hear an amen to that? Love covers a multitude of sins. You got to go after this stuff. Stop pretending and go after it. Stop dying on your own and get together with a bunch of guys that you can trust, that you begin to build trust, and you know what? Just say, we're going to pursue Christ. That's what we're going to do. We're going to learn his word. We're going to apply his word. We're going to pursue Christ and get after it. That's what he's talking about. Fruitful discipleship is seeking to impact others for Christ by training like Christ. You live it. You're modeling it for them. And you say, well, how do you do that? Well, you know, we, we train our guys. So they do all their study all week long. And then they come to our class, and then we beat them up over what they learned. You know, did you get that down? Let me test you on it. Let me try it. will put you in that situation. How are you going to apply that? Pull those verses out. We're getting them to live the truth. We eat meals with them. We watch them in ministry. We are in their homes. They're in our homes. We try to do as much as we can. Now, they can't live with me. I don't want them all in my house. Okay, so I understand all the time, 24-7, but at the same time, I want to spend as much time as I can with them, and they want to spend time. Yeah, we just spend time with each other because we're in this process of learning life together. So that Christ is honored in our homes, in our workplaces, in our school, in every situation, we're trying to live for him. We're not playing games. It's all about Christ. Are you tracking with me? That's the process. Intentional relationships for the purpose of growth. So it's that directed, empowered by the Spirit of God, intentional and extended life example with the involvement of the body of Christ so that others come to Christ and become like Christ. Discipleship is modeling Exactly what Christ did for his men, would live with them. Friends, every aspect Christ said is perfect. Everything that Christ did is perfect. And discipleship is what he did, and the community of the church should imitate how Christ discipled his men as much as possible. You can't live with them like he did, but you can get closer, and you can be more involved. Don't ignore the command to make disciples. If you're in Christ, you're in. Get after it right now. Get in intentional relationships. It's messy. It's difficult. Yeah, but it's exactly what Christ expects you to do. It's not clean and mean. It's not. So number four in your, in your outline, making discipleship uh, is your mission. Making disciples is your mission. And the mission of this church and every other church is very vast. It's local. So you, as you're going, you're making disciples. You're trying to be evangelistic. You're trying to share the gospel. Uh, you're preaching the gospel as you go through life. And then you're also seeing this internationally. Look what he says. He talks about this, go therefore and make disciples of what? All the nations. So it's not just a local thing. We're going out to other nations to establish the church so that church is making disciples there and reaching out to those regions. Making disciples of other nations requires a church in order to make disciples biblically. So basically doing missions is doing church elsewhere, and we're trying to get it established so that disciples are made. And if you have Christ's heart, then you'll have his heart to make disciples even in other places. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, not wishing for any to come to, repair, uh, to, any to perish, but for all to come to what? Repentance. Do you have the same heart to reach the lost of all the nations? That's what Christ is asking you. And making disciples is helping others come to Christ, become like Christ, because it's also to help others come to know the greatness of the triune God. What does he say in verse 19? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Discipleship is not merely teaching them to obey, but it's also teaching them the fullness of the triune God. You're helping them to get to know God. You're trying to show that. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's, it's getting to know. Uh, uh, even eternal life is defined by knowledge of understanding. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of what? Knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Your mission is to introduce people, introduce lost people to Christ and to help his children to get to know Christ more intimately and deeply, that triune God. And Christ's statement when he says, all authority is given to me, 
It's telling you making disciples includes the power of God. He's going to help you. And he says, I'm going to be with you always, which means his special presence is with you in that process. Both his power and his presence are a part of this process. The problem is is sometimes when we don't experience his presence and his power is we're just not doing what he's called us to do. We're not involved in the process of intentional relationships for the purpose of growth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Both his power and presence are used in pursuing this great mission. We've made it so formal, we've made it so missional, we've lost the relational element of it. It's so easy in student ministry to establish discipleship relationships. You have a youth staff, you have youth, they go, well, i got to learn from the youth staff, so that's what they do. As we get to be adults, we begin to say, well, that's really optional. It's not. It's not. And I'm not sure how it happened, but in the Church of Jesus Christ today, we've lost that priority Your children need to see you discipling others. Do you know why? They need to know why they're here on this planet. And if they don't see you discipling and see you filling out your purpose, then what happens is they're going to adopt another purpose. They're going to see that they're here for some other reason. They need to see what you're doing with them is the same that you're doing with others. They need to see you involved in this process of growing or they're not going to have the priority of growing. This is so vital to the health of your own family. We don't even understand why the family's falling apart. And part of it is we don't understand discipleship. We don't understand why God has put us here. You're to invest in them, but you're also to invest in others, and they should see a continuity in all of that, that we're here to intentionally invest into people so they come to Christ or become like Christ. So let's wrap this up. Are you ready? Okay, I know it's after lunch. The Chick-fil-A stuff's starting to work. So letter A, are you genuinely obedient to Christ in discipleship? John 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they what? They follow me. The Greek word follow is road and path. My sheep take my path and Christ's path is making disciples. John 17, 18, and thou didst send me into the world, I also send them into the world. You're here to make disciples. As a part of the church, You're to intentionally and relationally invest into others so that others will come to Christ and become like Christ. Are you following Christ? Are you actually intentionally fulfilling your purpose by following what God has called you to do? And if you're not following his purpose, then something's wrong. Maybe that you live by fear, not faith. It may be that you've never been taught the importance of discipleship. It may be that you have a wrong view of salvation. I don't know. But whatever it is, it's hindering you in doing what God has called you to do. And here's what's tricky. As a believer, the Bible teaches that in Romans 6, 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. Do you have a heart that wants to obey this? If you're sitting here going, nope, don't want to do it, not going to do it, that's a problem. That's a bigger problem than you just want, not wanting to make disciples. That's a problem about is your heart redeemed? Because if you're born again, you want to do what his word commands you to do. That I didn't put that in you. He did when he regenerated you, when he caused you, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, he caused you to be born again. When that happened, he gave you a new heart. And that new heart, according to Romans 6, 17, wants to obey. 1 Peter 1, 1 and 1, 2, again, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ. You were saved to obey the Word of God. There are no wimpy, carnal, partial believers with, you know, any assurance, and so only obedient to this command, and this command is not optional. Do not ignore the command to make disciples. It's killing the church of Jesus Christ. It is. Letter B, as a church, the members are to be committed to the relationship of discipleship together. There's no spectator mentality. The Christian culture destroys discipleship, this spectator mentality. And so so so-called make-believers who don't serve anyone, are not accountable, invest in no one, are not in God's will. And therefore, those who are solo, all about your own family, attend church once a month, you're in sin. Um, that's my job. I'm supposed to point it out even when it's uncomfortable. But you're violating Hebrews 10 to gather together. Uh, You're violating all the commands that tell you to minister your spiritual gifts to one another. You're violating God's command in Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, to to give faithfully. You're to be involved and connected and interconnected to a local church. And the next generation, I mean, it's like, well, I'm not into commitment. Listen, if you're not into commitment, you're not into Christ. Because in order to be a Christian, you had to be committed. Do you understand what I'm saying? When he said you had to pick up your cross and follow him, that's commitment. 
You said, I'm willing to die to follow Jesus. That's what you said when you got saved. I didn't make that up, right? And doesn't he say, if you're not willing to hate your father, hate your mother, and hate your own life, you can't be my disciple? And he's not talking about being a super Christian. He's talking about just being a Christian. You can't be a Christian unless that's there. You hated sin enough to turn from sin and to follow Christ. Can I hear an amen to that? Listen, that continues on. That doesn't die with salvation. That's part of your life. You've died to self, and you're going to say, I'm going to do what Christ calls me to do. Well, he calls you to make disciples together. And you're not in God's will if you're not. Part of God's will for every Christian is is to be part of a functioning com- community, and part of that community is the purpose of discipleship. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, very pointed. It says, from the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, that's every, you, every joint, and then according to the proper working of each individual part, that's you, causes the growth of the body for the building of itself in love. In other words, as we're involved, even in fellowship and relationship to one another, we're causing the whole body to become like Christ. Again, one more time, we can, as a group, put Christ on display better together than we can individually. And therefore, take the steps to become interconnected in relationship. Take the steps to be intentional relationships for the purpose of growth in Christ. But, you know, do it. Go for it somehow. Line yourself up. I'm not, again, not trying to step on anybody's air hose. I'm trying to help you to understand discipleship, to free you up. Some of you will get this. Maybe some of you won't. But understand, it's so vital. Letter C, stop fearing the relationships of discipleship. This is the biggest fear of preventing believers from discipling. The church and Christians are not looking for perfect examples. They're looking for progressing one. Your, your kids don't need perfect parents. They need progressing parents. And the church and Christians are not looking for perfect examples, but ones who are growing. The lost can point out your faults, but not when you change, not when you grow. Not when you're developing. You demonstrate the reality of Christ by changing, progressing, growing, loving. Change is an indicator of a healthy believer and a healthy church. Healthy churches change. They grow. They're not supposed to be the same. Oh, I like it when it was back then. Oh, it's like saying, I like it when we were a toddler. You know, it's like, wait a minute. you got to grow up. Things change. You mature. It's an indicator of healthy, healthy Christianity. When you've stopped developing, you're deteriorating. You should always be growing. Is there any age that you can live on this planet when you should stop growing? Anybody? I don't care if you're 80. You're still growing. You're still growing. A true follower of Christ learns from the preached word and from the teaching of community groups and small groups and podcasts and books and MP3s and sermons and their discipler. Yet learn, but a true discipleship is 24-7 learner, meaning they're learning from the comments of made even in fellowship from friends, from children. When, you're, when you have a discipleship mentality, when you're in conversation with somebody and somebody pops off something that convicts your heart, you learn from that. You know why? Because the issue is not what they said, not who they are, but if they spoke truth, then you want to be like Christ. Are you with me? When the little kid goes, Pastor Mula, you shouldn't talk that way, and they're right, then I need to obey. Because that's what we do. We learn from anyone. We grow. We're a learner. Old, young, rich, poor, distant, close, it doesn't matter. For the true learner, all relationships become a means of you becoming like Christ. Are you tracking with me on this? It doesn't, this age thing is freaking people out. You can have old and young together, and that old guy could be a baby Christian, and the young guy could be a Christian who's five years old in the Lord. It doesn't matter. You all learn, and you become like Christ. Letter D, making disciples requires the strength of God. You know, we just talked about it. It's got to be God through you, the Spirit of God through you. Obviously, Christ in you in salvation, the Spirit through you in sanctification. You can't do it. And maybe today you need to deal with that as well and just learn what it means to become that kind of Christian. I hope this was helpful to you. My goal was not to hammer, but to build you up, free you up so that you can have relationships. You can learn from one another. You can grow in in general comments. People can come to you and express desires and things like that that you can learn from, that you could maybe be in a group of men where you'd say, we're going to grow, guys. We're going to learn theology. We're going to learn the Bible. We're going to learn something together. But as we do, we're going to also help each other. We're going to confess our sins to one another. We're going to help each other to kind of deal with some of the weaknesses of our own lives so that we can grow to be more like Christ. And we're going to overcome certain sin habits. Listen, some of you are really beating yourself up. Abraham was a liar, right? He lied about Sarah once, right? And then he lied about her again. What's amazing is she forgave him, all right? But he had a propensity. David was licentious. He, he, was, he, he had lust issues, correct? 
and it finally manifested itself. You know, Peter is my hero. He had mouth issues, right? You know, when he, he took one foot out of his mouth, he put the other one right back in. You know, he was constantly doing that. Every one of you has a bent, an evil, evil bent, and you're going to have that the rest of your life. Welcome to the family of God. No one's perfect here. And then all of you struggle with sin at various levels at various times. Listen, we're all in this together. The issue is, is are we going to actually strive and do everything we can with all the means of grace to become like Jesus Christ? That's the thing. And relationships, discipleship, is a part of that. It's not the only thing. You need great preaching. You, you need great teaching. You need people with integrity and character, you know, in your leadership. You would need that. But you also need the investment of other men in your life. You need the investment of discipleship. You need it. I need it. There's no one who's above this. Everybody needs it. So let's be those men who go after it. Not only in your own homes, not exclusively with your children, but with every aspect of your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these men. Thank you for this time. Pray that you would help us to understand these truths. Think differently about discipleship in a way that we might actually live it and implement it so that it might be an incredible enrichment and growth in our life, that it might even change our life in a dramatic way. And Father, we'll give you all the glory for what you do because it's all about you. We want your church to be all manifesting your character and your person in such a way that people just marvel at who you are because you are worth all of our praise, all of our worship, and all of our marveling. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's men said, amen. amen. The proceeding was a sermon from Calvary Bible Church in Burbank, California. To learn more, visit calvarybiblechurch.org. All scripture quotations from the New American Standard Bible are copyrighted by the Lockman Foundation.